<laughs> Hello. But the only thing I'm gracious, I'm not like the, the at DCC where I go to non community events. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but okay. all I know is that I'm gracious to the tracker. Okay. Like Thank you. <laughs> but that's because I'm in this to represent people. Uh, as you know, uh, I've had the honor and the pleasure uh, to serve the town of Southampton for the last eight years. And truly, it was uh, an honor to do that. And as you also know, the outset of my time, uh, particularly as town supervisor, was I wanted to look at the town as a whole, and I wanted to look at the needs of the town from every part of town, from hamlet to hamlet, village to village, uh, and look at what were the primary needs and how could we, as your local government, best meet those needs. And one of the things that all of you made sure I knew uh, as I got elected, and that was that Flanders, Riverside, Northampton felt that uh, its needs were not always met and uh, that there was uh, a need for economic development. There was a need uh, to deal with many of the blighted properties. There was a need to deal with uh, some of the traffic issues around the traffic circle.
wasteful spending. We saved about five, just about six million dollars the first year, about five million dollars the next year, and we created the kind of services. We created the Community Response Center. Uh, we added to our senior services. We added to our senior transportation system. We added to our youth services uh, and a number of other things. And we also got then the funding to do uh, the RAP study uh, and, and a number of other things. And um, didn't raise your taxes in six years. Kept the, the uh, property tax rate flat for those six years. And, um, and also wanted to work with the schools uh, to do what they could. Um, their tax rate down, that's a little harder to do because uh, that's not our purview. Uh, but one of the things that was also very important to this district, if you remember, was the equalization rate because so many of you were paying uh, your school taxes into the Riverhead School tax and, uh, and the feeling that uh, there was a different, uh, there needed to be an equalization rate. So I traveled to Albany uh, three times uh, to meet with Forbes, the Tim Bishop lost the seat in 2014. Um, I was asked by several to consider uh, running this time around. Uh, for me, that wasn't an obvious decision. I could have run for town supervisor one more time. Uh, I think I probably would have gotten the support I needed to do that. Um, as you probably know, I won the three last elections by 60-40 margins, and I think that was a reflection of what uh, town hall was doing for people uh, and so it was a hard decision for me to make um, but when a lot of people including my kids my four kids said to me mom you have to do this our generation depends on this our generation depends on somebody who cares about being able to go to college without drowning in debt that cares about making sure that there's a job market out there that we can actually tap into but that also cares about that mass transportation is available to us here, that affordable housing is available to us here, that we can actually live and thrive in this, in this area. <coughs> and in this area, which right now, none of my kids are living in this area for that reason. And a lot of your kids and grandkids are not living in this area for that reason. And there are a lot of things we can and should be doing about that. But I also care like I did as town supervisor, I care about the seniors in our community, and I care about knowing that seniors who want to age in place can do that. Seniors that need to access care, health care, need to know that their Medicare is protected, not privatized or voucherized, and that Social Security is protected, something that each and every one of you has spent your lifetime working and paying into. And you need to know that that is protected for you. And you need to know that you have someone in Congress that cares about all of that. You will also remember that in my six years as town supervisor, we had five named storms. And we have seen the effects of climate change right here in our backyard. And for us as Long Islanders, we know what that means. We know that there's a cost to that. There's a threat to our livelihood. There's a threat to our homes. And for me, who represented you in town hall at the time, for me the challenge was to make sure that we were prepared enough, that we could make sure all of you were safe, and that we could be there in the aftermath without having to raise your taxes to pay for that whole effort. And that wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do, particularly when there were five of them. In, in six years, uh, but we did it. And you will remember that in the aftermath of those storms, what was important to us too, and Flanders was one of the hardest hit areas in Sandias. I don't need to tell all you that, you know that. And what we made sure then was 
that when you were talking about, you know, I've got to get through the FEMA, I've got to get through my insurance agency, what is the Army Corps doing for us? And if you recall, we set up shop right here, and we got the FEMA representatives here, we got the local insurance agencies to come down here, and we made sure that all of you had a one-stop shop opportunity to come in and talk to the different agencies that you needed to talk to, instead of having to be on the phone with them, getting put on hold. Uh, the other problem I think we have is LIPA. LIPA does not serve us well in this area at all. You all know that. You know what you're paying in utility rates. You know that they're the first to go down whenever we have a storm. Uh, and that was one thing that we kept pounding the state about. We need reform at LIPA. We need a utility that's actually here to serve us. We need a utility that is interested in tapping in to alternative energy, and that's interested in helping all of you do that too. And that's how we started the Solar Rise Southampton program that makes it available to all of you uh, that are interested in alternative energy for your, uh, for your homes and for your businesses at affordable rates. And if you're not aware of that program, I welcome you to go on the town's website and look at it, Solar Rise Southampton. It's a way for all of you to get together with your neighborhood and tap into solar at you get a price reduction the more of you who, who uh, tap into it. It's a great program. You can also tap into the Nice Order program uh, that will bring a home energy expert to your house. We'll look at what you, uh, how you can save money uh, in, in tapping into if it is uh, tightening the airflow in your house, if it is uh, upgrading some of your, um, uh, your appliances, that kind of thing. And they will lend you the money less cost than what it costs you, what your utility bill is today, uh, and your monthly payment will be the difference between what you're saving and what you're paying today until you pay it off. So it's a great program, and if you haven't taken advantage of it, um, and I'm happy to talk to any of you about it afterwards, but it's a great program. So these are the kinds of things that I think you want to know that you have someone in Congress that knows your district, that knows your neighborhood, that knows the kinds of issues that are on your minds on a day-to-day -day basis, and that will represent you on a day-to-day -day basis the way I did in town hall. My door will be open, my phone will be answered, I won't be sending my surrogates, my wherever they are, our staffers, uh, I will come to your meetings, and I will answer <coughs> your phone calls, just like I did at town hall. And today, we're represented by Mr. Zeldin, who I understand got wind of the fact that I'm going to be here tonight and is now rushing to, to nip at my heels and go here, too. Um, and besides trying to make good on the zip code thing, that, um, you know, I, I do hope it happens. I hope it happens. You know, it, it should happen. Uh, but we're talking about someone who has wanted to privatize and has voted uh, so uh, to voucher the Medicare who is not working to protect Social Security, uh, who is not working uh, to make sure that alternative energy uh, is part of how we lower utility costs here on Long Island, uh, who's a climate change denier. I don't know how you live, let alone legislate, on Long Island and deny the fact that climate change is here and it's real. And if we as government on all levels don't get together and start to understand this, to plan for it, and to make sure that the cost of these storm events and other problems that will come inevitably and already have because of climate change will not end up in your bags and in your pocketbooks, then you have a government that is not serving you well and you have a representative that's not serving you well. This is a representative, Mr. Zeldin, who voted every single time to defund and investigate now I ask you, I got four kids. I know what access to affordable health care means to a lot of people. And Planned Parenthood is for a lot of people the only way they can access affordable health care, particularly for young women. And when you get into the whole discussion about the morals around ending pregnancies, but when you're talking about pregnancies that are prevented by access to affordable contraceptives.
conception, testing, cancer screening, all the things that save lives and save families and make sure that there is access to affordable health care for a lot of people who otherwise don't have it available to them. These are big issues. These are important issues. These are the things that matter in our day-to-day -day lives. And when we're denying climate change, denying the fact that this is a big part of our reality today, while we're denying the fact that we have people who have no other access to affordable health care. And I am the first to say, the Affordable Care Act is here to stay for us. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, we, we if you don't mind, we're going to move to questions. We did invite you guys back together for a little later, right. a little closer yeah, to the election. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we love hearing from you, but if you don't mind, a couple of questions yeah, from the floor absolutely. if anybody has any, because um, we do have to move on to an agenda, and then if he does come, As you can we're tell, I'm old fashioned <laughs> about this stuff. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm any, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, <laughs> nope. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So, how do you, well, exactly. So, um, because you know Flanders, Riverside, this whole area, what are some like key areas that you see that, that you can leverage at the federal level that you can bring here locally to have like impact as we revitalize, as we take care of our community? Um, I'm sure you give some thought to that. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, as you know, we work very hard to get grants uh, to this area. Uh, and I think working with our state officials on that and some of the federal agencies like the Department of Transportation, areas like that, uh, I think are really important, particularly as we're rolling out this gap plan and getting people interested mm -hmm. in it. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we have not done well enough uh, on Long Island, uh, and I think we're still not doing well enough, that is getting government on all levels to work together. Uh, and I think getting state agencies, county agencies, and local municipal governments to work together on a lot of these things. <coughs> school system today that depending on whether you're in a high income, high real estate value area, your school district will reflect that. That's got to change. Every kid in America has got to have access to the same level of quality education throughout. And every kid in America that wants to go to college should be able to do that without leveraging their future. And that is the kind of thing that I think matters in this district. I think it matters in Flanders, knowing that every working mother and father that needs access to affordable child care, that needs to know that their kid has access to quality early childhood education, mass transportation is another big issue for this area. All of you should be able to get on a bus when you need it to take you where you need to go that is something where the county, the state, and the federal government needs to work together to work on those things. There are environmental issues around that, too. Um, so Department of Transportation, uh, you know, all of these federal agencies need to be brought into the conversation on what we need in this district. Any other? Chris, you have? Uh, constructive criticism. 
<laughs> project, <laughs> Chris. Pro project to the back of the room. So oh, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Janet, you can also move up if you want. Yeah, <laughs> that's my argument always. Please, move closer. We're well, trying to keep it intimate here. Also, I have a question for you. Um, yep. We went from the greatest generation to perhaps the worst, and that has to do with debt. And leadership, um, history shows that leadership um, rises when someone from one party takes on the issue of the other party and tries to bring everything together. And because of your experience in Southampton, trying to be fiscally responsible, can you bring that to Washington so that you can work with both parties to try to keep that debt from getting higher and start bringing it down. Absolutely, and uh, you know, honestly, that was one of the reasons I was asked to, to run for this uh, job was because I had a track record. As many of you recall, when I was first elected, I was the only one that didn't have an R next to my name. I ran as unaffiliated, then I registered with the Independence Party, and I ran on the Democratic Independence Working Family uh, lines. And I always said, I'm here for people, I'm not here for politics. I wasn't there on a party agenda. I wasn't there to pay party politics. That never mattered to me. It mattered to me that I was here to serve. My background was in serving, not in government, but in public service in the not-for-profit and social service sector and in education. And so to me, that's what the job was. It wasn't there to you know, be there as a, a, a party cheerleader. It was there to, to serve. And for six out of my eight years at town hall, I served in a minority. You know, I didn't have I didn't have a majority vote until my last two years there. But we got a lot of work done. Why? Because it never bothered me. In fact, I wanted to reach across the proverbial aisle and work with anyone who wanted to work with me. And you probably remember almost better than anyone, Chris, because you were very involved uh, with all of those discussions. Uh, you know, when Chris was still there, when Danny was still there, and whatever. And I said to them, we've got an economic mess and meltdown on our hands here. We've got to revamp the policies and procedures here. We've got to get auditors in and, and just retool all of our books here. And we've got to get in on a borrowing uh, program that's completely different. And without those two votes, you know, I was not going to get that done. But I worked with them, and they worked with me, and I said to them, we've got to get this done together. And that is exactly what we need in Washington today, because those conversations are not happening in Washington today. I mean, Congress has what? A, some dismal, you know, 80% disapproval rating. I mean, it's, it's, it's at an all-time high. And I will say this about Mr. Zeldin, too. You know, two years ago, he was telling all of you that he was going to be the big, you know, he's going to reach across the aisle, he's going to work with everyone. He hasn't done anything like that. In very few instances. He doesn't even work with his Republican cohort next door, Peter King, who wanted him to sign on to the no-fly, no-buy uh, gun uh, safety bill. Now, I think that's a big issue. You know, I'm a mom of four kids. And I don't want to have to worry about, and you shouldn't have to worry about your kids going to school. And when our kids are doing drills on a regular basis, instead of being in the classroom and learning stuff they need to learn to figure out how they should stay safe if a shooter comes in, I mean, something's wrong with this picture. And when we have a congressman today that won't even sign <coughs> on to keeping people on the terrorist watch list who are not allowed to fly commercially, but they're allowed to buy ammunition and guns? I mean, that just lacks common sense. And I'm not talking about people not being able to keep their hunting rifles and go out and you know do their hunting permits and deer hunt and all of that stuff. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about people worrying about their kids not being able to go to school safely. The rest of us not being able to go to a movie without worry what's going to happen to us. And this is out of control. And we have got to put <coughs> common sense gun safety laws in place. More than 70% of Americans want that today. Most NRA members want that today. 
And so these are the kinds of things that, you know, we need to work across the aisle <coughs> on all of these things. I've never shied away from doing it. In fact, I've been at the forefront of doing it. And it's one of the reasons I'm running for this, because you need someone in Congress that will get people together, that will look at the issues we're facing, both on a local level, right here in District 1, as well as on a national level, and say, we've got to resolve these things. We are taking taxpayer money on a daily basis. We're dealing with debt. We're dealing with what is the future of this country, and we cannot work together. That's just wrong. We've had too many years of it. I'm going to go down there. And I'm going to represent the way I have on a local level, and I'm going to knock on the doors of my everyone colleagues and say, I know you're interested in this. Let's talk about it. There is actually a bipartisan climate change lobby now uh, that has members of, of all parties on it, and that's one of the things I'd like to serve on one Sunday. Janice had a question. I want to take care of your views on affordable health care. My views on affordable health care are the following. Uh, more than 20 million Americans have health care today that didn't have it before the Affordable Care Act. That said, there are a lot of kinks in this that have to be worked out. But that is also a product of the stalemate that's going on in Washington. It's a product of the fact that people are not willing to sit together, accept the fact that the Supreme Court has now twice upheld the Affordable Care Act and has recognized the fact that we need, like the rest of the industrialized world today has, access to affordable health care for every single person, and affordable health insurance to get to that. And if we don't work together on that to make sure that it works, and there are kinks in it, there's no question about it, I'm the first to, I'm the first to say that, but I'm also the first to say Unless we have willing partners across the aisle that will sit down and work out these issues. And it's interesting because a lot of Republicans are saying, well, we gotta we gotta come around to this. We've got to come around to this because this is an issue that the American people understand that we need. And without it, we are not gonna bring down the cost of health care. You know, over two hundred billion worth of uh, or million worth of um, unnecessary tests are conducted today. We cannot negotiate pharmaceutical costs as a government today. There are so many parts of how medicine is provided today that is too costly, that's wasteful, where there's fraud, and all of these things need to be dealt with in order to bring down the cost of health care. We pay almost a third or more than the rest of the industrialized world does for simple procedures in this country. And all of that can only be dealt with if everyone works together. Because don't we want to be a nation where we are healthy? Don't we want to be a nation where all of you know that you can go to the doctor of your choice Get the medical care you need without it breaking your neck. And we can get to that. Many parts of the world have. We just need to work together to get to, get to that. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you.